Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. In 2015, world leaders legally agreed to cut emissions to limit global warming to well below two degrees. They haven't achieved it. Today, environment reporter Michael Slezak on where we stand at the end of the latest global climate summit in Egypt. Mikey, I can see that COP27 and what is COP27 is being Googled a lot at the moment. So just simply, first of all, please tell me what is COP27? Yeah, so COP27 is the 27th Conference of Parties. Mm -hmm. Um, And that just means it's a meeting of the parties that had signed what was called the UNFCCC or the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So that was um, signed back in 1992. And this is the 27th meeting under that convention since then. Welcome to Egypt. Our distinguished guests, welcome to COP27. Most people, just to put this into context, they probably remember the summit that happened in Paris or near Paris back in 2015, the COP that happened then, COP21, when the world leaders, they came up with the Paris Agreement. At that time, Mikey, there was a lot of criticism about this, this process. Even a former NASA scientist, James Hansen at the time, he was describing the summit and COP21 as a fraud, as a fake. He says it's all just worthless words. Yeah, look, Hansen was really critical at the time and he wasn't wasn't alone. What I understood was he wasn't necessarily saying the agreement itself was a bad thing, but that it was sort of hypocritical in a way that mm. all these countries got together. They, they signed this agreement promising to do all this stuff, but it was all words and there was no action. This is really a total fraud. We're not going to reduce emissions as long as we let fossil fuels be the cheapest form of energy. There are- you know, his main point at the time was that fossil fuels will continue to be burned, you know, for as long as they're the cheapest thing to burn. Mm. And governments had one job to do and make it not the cheapest thing, so basically tax them. Just remind me, Mikey, what was the Paris Agreement? What did the leaders of the world agree to? So, look, the absolute sort of central part of the Paris Agreement was countries around the world promised, uh, they made a legally binding promise to stop climate change at well below two degrees. And furthermore, made a, made a promise, a legally binding promise, to try to keep warming at just 1.5 there degrees. There were a few dissenting voices, but their concerns were drowned out by the support of the big polluters whose actions can have the biggest impact, China, India and the US. This agreement sends a powerful signal that the world is firmly committed to a low carbon future. So nearly every nation signed up for it. Both poor and rich countries, which was a bit of a breakthrough because prior to that we had these agreements that were really just for rich countries. And the other sort of central part of the agreement was that countries set their own targets for how they would contribute to this effort, what emissions cuts they would make. The really crucial thing about those targets was that they could only go in one direction. You could set them however you want, but they had to be updated Um, every five years, and they had to get stronger. Mm. Australia signed on. It was a coalition government. Tony Abbott had just been ousted as leader, so Turnbull was there, but it was Abbott's commitments that were taken there. We we had just gotten rid of our um, carbon tax. We're trying to get rid of the Climate Change Authority. Um, They were dismantling, basically, Australia's climate action Mm. policies at the time. Tony Abbott set the initial targets for Australia. What were they... Yeah, so um, we went to the Paris Agreement with a target to reduce our emissions by between 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, there's a definite commitment to 26 percent, uh, but we believe under the policies that we've got, 
uh, with the circumstances that, that we think will apply that we can go to 28%. This is fairly and squarely uh, in the middle of comparable economies. That received a lot of criticism. At the time, Australia's own climate change authority released a report that was really critical of those, those targets, saying that really we needed to cut emissions by up to 60% by 2030. People weren't really happy with Australia's approach back in 2015. So let's have a look now at where we stand at this latest summit because, of course, we have a new government now. Where are we up to in terms of our targets and what we're doing and how we're viewed by the world? So... um uh, with a change of government in Australia came a, came a change in our approach to these things, and, and in particular, um, I guess the kind of the sort of top line of that is the is the change in our targets. So they've gone up to forty three percent. What we did was work out what good policy looked like, and it happened to come out with a forty three percent target by twenty thirty. What business? But that been that target, that new target that we have set by Anthony Albanese. That's still well below other countries like the UK, for instance, isn't it? It is a long way below what other countries have put forward. Every year there's this report done by um, German Watch and a bunch of other prominent climate NGOs that ranks uh, the climate action of, of, of about 59 countries. Previously, we've been the very dead last on that. These changes that we've put in place have, have raised us four places. It's a long way behind the UK, which is which is roughly 75% by 2030. The US has lifted their target to about 52. Germany is 65%. We are, we are nowhere near the top. We are not consistent with what we need to do to stop warming at 2 degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees. Mm. Scientists say to do that, we, we really need to cut emissions by about 75% by 2030. So we have made progress, but it's not in line with what a lot of countries we compare ourselves are doing or with what the science says needs to happen. So COP27, we're up to. Some people do question whether these are all worth it. Of course, we do see the protesters out there saying, you know, not enough is being done. They use our taxpayers' money to subsidise the fossil fuel industry. Is there anything that can be achieved from this particular summit this time in Egypt? So this particular summit um, is what's been called um, an implementation COP rather than an ambition COP. Can there be stuff achieved? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think some of the things aren't as exciting as brand new targets, but there needs to be work done on, on what's called loss and damage. So developing nations around the world are copying the brunt of the impacts of climate change despite not having contributed so much to the problem. And so they're calling for compensation and indeed that issue is written into the Paris Agreement. It's required that, that progress is made to advance that issue. What will you be doing to step up and actually put money into loss and damage? Well, in all honesty, the most important thing that we can do is stop, mitigate enough that we prevent loss and damage. Um, so that's being discussed sort of to, for the first time in a kind of advanced way. It's not We're not going to get reach any agreements around it, but some progress should be made Similarly, there's a lot of work around climate finance, transferring money from the developed world to the developing world to help them transition in a just way. Mm. And then, look, there are also these side agreements that occur that aren't sort of the Paris Agreement itself, but that people sign up to. So Australia has signed up to a methane pledge, which the Morrison government didn't do, promising to cut methane, a particularly potent greenhouse gas, and a deforestation pledge to end deforestation. So progress, albeit too slow, I think is, is being made. So some progress has been made on the sidelines, on the fringes. But seven years on, Mikey, seven years since the Paris Agreement was signed, was James Hansen right? Was it all a fraud? The 1.5, two degree target, was it all just words? Well, look, I don't know if James Hansen was exactly right, but you know, on balance there's there hasn't been enough action, that's for sure. Mm. We're, we're not on, on target to achieve the aims of the Paris Agreement. So just recently, the UN um, Environment Program, UNEP, released a report that said that there's no credible pathway. 
to, to, to stop warming at 1.5 degrees. We are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. You know, and, and again, countries had made legally binding promises to, to try to do that. And now because of that delay, it's probably, according to the UN Environment Programme, probably impossible. Looking, I guess, more broadly at what countries have done under this framework, um, if every country's conditional pledges, so countries say that, you know, if X, Y and Z thing happened, then we'll do this, this will be our stronger pledge, uh, warming could stop at 1.8 degrees, so below 2, but nowhere near 1.5. And that's if they're properly and fully implemented. The more unconditional pledges that countries have committed to, warming will get to 2.6 degrees by the end of the century. Mm. Um, and again, that's if they're implemented. And currently implementation of, of, of those promises is, is not adequate, according to experts around the world. You know, was James Hansen right? I don't know. Uh, that 2.6 degrees is better than what it looked like before the Paris Agreement was signed. Mm. And I guess you could look at what some countries have done as a kind of poster child of, of maybe what the Paris Agreement is meant to achieve. So to take the UK, their promises to cut emissions by about 75% by, by 2030, that's in line, according to experts, with a 1.5 degree world. Mm. That's consistent with stopping warming at 1.5 degrees. So maybe if we get more of that, the Paris Agreement could sort of look like a success. Mm, but Mikey, from everything that you've said, we're not going to reach the Paris Agreement target we won't succeed in achieving a two degree or even a 1.5 degree reduction in warming. And if that is the case, that we won't reach that, what does that mean for the world? Well, I mean, it's a catastrophe, mm. right? Um, it, it really is. I don't, I don't, I've, there's no other way to put it. People, people talk about um, the Paris Agreement trying to avoid catastrophic climate change. In a way, that's a funny way to put it, right? When you, you look around, you see the bushfires here, the black summer bushfires, you see the bushfires around the world, you see other extreme weather, that is catastrophic climate change. Mm. You know, we are seeing it now. We're at one degree of warming. At 1.5, it's going to be much worse. At two, it's going to be much, much worse. At 1.5 degrees, we're all already going to lose all, virtually like 90% of coral reefs. At two degrees, they're basically gone. I guess that's, that's where we're heading. It's not too late to, to stop the worst of those impacts. But the targets that countries around the world have put in place so far don't get us where we need to get to. Mikey Slezak is the ABC's environment reporter. Australia hopes to host COP31 in 2026. This episode was produced and mixed by Chris Dengate and Flint Duxfield. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. Over the weekend, catch This Week with David Lipson. He'll be looking into the devastating floods in New South Wales and asking what the G20 tells us about China's relationship with Australia. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again on Monday. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.